Hey, common scientists, so glad you're tuning in this week because this week we are talking about something I love, donuts, and something I'm not so excited about, donut economics. But very important concept, I would say it's something that anyone should have just like a high level understanding of, both so that you can think about your consumerism in the world, your small role in economics, but also so that you can think about some of the limits that our planet might have. So I want to kick it to Dre to give us a little bit of background. And maybe you also tuned in last time. It's kind of fun. We had coffee and now donuts. So I'll kick it to Dre. Thanks, Lauren. So the donut or donut economics is a visual framework for sustainable development. It, of course, is shaped like a donut. Some people say a life belt, but of course, we prefer donuts. A much tastier discussion, <laughs> right? So this concept really come, brings into play the planetary boundaries as well as our social limits. It was posited by Kate Raworth, an, an economist, of course, and it has, I believe, nine social limits inside of the donut. So the things that we might fall short of if it goes inside the donut hole. And then on the outside is the planetary boundaries, right? So don't exploit and... Um, give up on our people, but also don't destroy our planet for the ideal of constant growth. That's kind of what the idea that she's trying to go up against is this endless growth. What's in the center hole? Ideas such as, so the social limits, the social needs, water, food, health, education, income or work, peace and justice, social equity, housing, networks, energy, political voice, and gender equality. So those are the 12 and then on the outside, the planetary boundaries, what, how can we excel as a species without destroying our planet? Is biodiversity loss something we have to worry about? Land conversion, which is like damages to habitat, removal of carbon sinks, disrupting of cycles, freshwater withdrawals, chemical pollution, climate change, ozone depletion, air pollution, ocean, ocean acidification, and then nitrogen and phosphorus loading. Okay. Now, I really like this concept because I think, number one, it's human-centric. It's really, really important that we get away from specifically the already developed countries, the nations that are thriving, like America, who likes to tout around as being the richest country to ever exist. So I think we should start recycling or re-attributing a lot of our resources into instead of endless growth, which is... Growth has got us a long way. I love it. But now it's time to really cycle that back and put that back into a lot of our social needs. And then, of course, protecting the environment. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that overview. And I also appreciate your sentiment for the importance of this balance. The thing that I love about this theory is that, like, the juicy, delicious donut part, right? Like... <laughs> That's where you want to be. Yes. So I remember that being like the green zone, which for me is so easy to remember. Because, yeah, of course you want to be where the donut's at. <laughs> like, of course, you don't want to be in the hole because there's nothing there. And you don't want to be on the outside because there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. And so, like, this idea that outside of my juicy, delicious donut was like planetary boundaries, these things that you can't push too far, That some of some of which we're already pushing really far. And then this idea that on the inside, you just you just fall a little short, right? Like you're not meeting humans' needs. So yeah, I was really fascinated by, by that and love the analogy because yeah, I'm a foodie and I am addicted to sugar like any good American. <laughs> so. That's funny. Yeah, I, I'm also a fan of the, of the framework and I think it is super important that Kate Raworth uh, like came up with it and is able to uh, popularize it. I think she, so she wrote a book on it and then has gone on a series of, of interviews and, and presentations since uh, trying to kind of uh, promote the donut economic mindset. And yeah, I'm just kind of curious. It, for me, it's, been a relatively new concept i can't actually id when i first heard of it when did you guys first hear of donut economics or start becoming aware of it first time i ever heard of it was within the last year or so because you mentioned it in a podcast and i was like wow 
That sounds awesome. I need to look into that. We need to do a cast on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I would probably say similarly in the last couple of years, I think I was privy to it maybe a little bit earlier, but hadn't really looked into it. And I, I personally am overwhelmed by just the idea of economics in general. So it's not mm. something that excited me because... Mm like just the just the word economics means so many different things in so many different contexts and is so overarching that like I was kind of freaked out by like diving in but when we did research for this cast I really liked the theory a lot I mean Kate did a really good job I think of creating something that wasn't um like needlessly challenging it just makes so much sense it's like yeah we need to live within the means of the planet and we need to provide for people and there's probably a range where that makes sense let's call it a donut because people like food like and it looks like the same the same shape so yeah I mean aware of it probably within the last few years really understanding it within the last week (laughs) but I think it is so valuable to think of to think of economics or to think of and when I say the word economics you guys should speak to this too but like when I say economics I think of like dealings with money period like any movement of goods or money that is like transferred I don't know if that's that's kind of like really broad but I guess like yeah it just makes sense that movement of goods needs to happen within bounds that like meet needs and don't exceed the planet's capabilities. I don't know. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, just, yeah. So I'm trying to remember how I've, I first heard of it. Um, I, and it's, it's something that I think has caught on because of the reasons that you were just talking about Lauren and why I'm so excited. About, I was so excited about sharing it with you guys on, uh, on a past cast uh, is just that it also beyond being such a, like a simple representation of what would be kind of a goal for a flourishing society. It also makes economics less scary. Uh, and yeah, I think I, that's one point that I had not thought so much about, but I think is especially true. Uh, and it is one observation is that, uh, she was, so I listened to an interview of her coming into this cast. And one of the things that she brought up was how in the past that the field of economics has been dominated by white men. And so her as a female coming to the table, uh, maybe like taking a fresh perspective, that was one of the, the themes of the of the interview was able to bring it more to uh, like a holistic aim, uh, which I thought was super refreshing, especially so an anecdote is in my intro to econ class, I remember looking at, uh, so an intro to econ, you learn about supply and demand and the more supply, the less, you can charge for something, the more demand, the more you can charge for something because more people want it. Uh, and the, to not get into the weeds, the professor was proposing that uh, elephants, so because of the way that ivory acts as a good in the economy, an inflexible good. So I'll just throw that name out there and you can do some common science research on inflexible goods. Um, but yeah, she, she, her proposed solution through the framework of traditional economics was that we should start to save the elephants. We should start farming them and selling the ivory because that will reduce the inflexible nature of the good. And I was like, huh, this makes sense based on the like graph that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. But this was just, to me, that was just one of one example of just how divorced a lot of this analysis is with, I mean, like ethics and finding a flourishing world for people and biodiversity. But yeah, anyways, that was just an anecdote that I 
wanted to bring it back to because yeah i mean it just this whole donut economics idea is is so revolutionary compared to the traditional model of growth is good can you dumb it down for me and maybe we need to come up with like a common science term like can you common as the whatever you just said because i don't know anything yeah. about ivory and i am so confused about like the example of it the anecdote okay so yeah like, the so what was the problem and what was the proposed solution so the problem is that ivory which is the comes from the tusks of different animals elephants rhinos etc it's it makes uh poachers a lot of money because it's what's called this in inflexible good because it's illegal you can charge immense amounts for it okay so her proposed solution solution was to legalize the trade of ivory and and make it so people could farm elephants and like saw off their tusks and sell them because then the cost would go down and less poaching would occur or the price would go down because there was more supply uh, of the ivory i see yeah but thank you for saying that because yeah i'm sure i didn't and that is that fits within the model of donut economics or this is something different um, to me, it was just, that was just an example that popped into my mind that may or may not like fit so neatly into the, the donut economic theory, but is just an example of like kind of classic Sorry. economics saying like, oh, let's just start farming elephants and sawing off their tusks because that's the way that the, the price curves work. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> to, to Aiden's point, to a point that you made mostly to Kate Raworth's or Raworth's point, yes, as to use your word, divorced from the planet, divorced from humans, right? It's not like our, our Keynesian economics, classical economics, circular flow, supply and demand. It, it, it's robotic. It's theoretical. It does not apply to human behavior. And that's why now they have a whole huge burgeoning uh, school of behavioral economics, right? How do people actually act? For example, with classical economics and Keynesian economics, there's been this characterization that co uh, often comes into play with economics. It's called homo economic, economicus. And this is the idea that the person, the human beings that are in these economic models in these classical economic models are not real people. They're people who always make the right decision. They always act in self-interest and think through problems and weigh out pros and cons, and they always act rationally. That's who these people are. Now, we know human beings. We know that's not how human beings work. And you know who else also knows that human beings don't work that way? Corporate America, advertisers, people who pay millions and millions and billions of dollars to hack our psychology and make us act irrationally right? Or make it conducive for our rational thinking. So I think that's one of the biggest issues. And that's to both of your guys' points into donut economics as a whole concept is that the idea for donut economics was to make money, was GDP. How do we make the most money as a company and as a, a government? How do we manipulate all these numbers? It doesn't take any human, it doesn't take any human consideration. It doesn't take in planetary boundaries. It doesn't take into play, oh, these people need something. We can't just go and strip that you mean away from them. Economics? You mean classical? Yeah, classical. Well, yeah, right. classical yeah, doesn't. Yeah. Donut economics does do these things, mm -hmm. and that's why I think it's important. And one thing, so some people might be saying, "Well, how do if we're just working in this circular way and we're so worried about planet? What about third world countries and this and that?" Well, she talks about only really applying this to developing nations, all of the nations who are superpowers and stable and they're all A-OK -okay and they can afford, right? They're not suffering, right? They're not, they're not lacking. They're not their world, anything like that. These are the cities and the countries that need to start applying this philosophy. And that's what I like about it is that it is a framework. It is a philosophy that is much different than something like supply and demand, where that is very mathematical. It is very rigid. It is very... Maybe rigid is not the right word, but it's just kind of inhuman, right? It's just like it doesn't really have that touch. 
versus this is a framework, yes, I'm sure they need to iron out a ton of details on it. But at the end of the day, humans are known for our ingenuity. That's what we're known for. So if we apply instead of growth, 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 growth to the point of late game capitalism, it's like if we just apply, hey, we're good now, right? As a government, as a nation, we're okay. Let's start worrying about these bigger issues that are going to really, really start. The wolf's going to be knocking at our door soon if we're not mm -hmm. start answering these questions and applying things such as donut economics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's cool is so she started a, like a group that uh, helps different cities in particular. Mm -hmm. So because there is seems to be more will at the local level, she right. helps uh, like work with these different cities to come up with their donut economic framework uh, for making a thriving society. And one of the first was Amsterdam, I believe. Uh, so one of the, like in the West, um, but trying to find a more equitable playing field for people and one where it's more circular and more and recycles more uh, goods. I'm, I'm trying to remember the details. It was a while back that I did do a little bit of reading into the, the Amsterdam scenario, but mm -hmm. a lot more of like trying to find where waste products from one company might become inputs for another one or or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am eager because I know the Amsterdam thing is just as it was just recently, like maybe even like how long ago was it just during the pandemic or during since COVID? Yeah, it, it was, I think so. Yeah, that's what that, that was my understanding that it was almost because of right, like that was like the catalyst to finally push a major city like Amsterdam over the hump, because obviously we the world saw it's, like we we got a world rocked, right? We were just like, whoa! Like there's so many systems that are out of date, out of place. We're in trouble, and a lot of this is like, I love capitalism. I I'm a beneficiary of it. America's great, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, capitalism is for growth. Capitalism is about the bottom line, and that's part of the reason why we didn't have masks on hand. That's part of the reasons why our supply chains were overseas, and when they cut off our supply chains because they had their own pandemic going on, we were struggling, and there was obviously hospital beds and all this type of stuff going on mass shortages all that stuff i'm not saying that it's as simple as being like oh let's go deal with economics but it's just the idea it's the philosophy behind it it's it's applying funds to these things so we're prepared as opposed to being like that doesn't help our bottom line so we're not going to apply funds towards fighting deforestation or this or that or blah 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 things that are really going to come back and bite us in the ass in 10 15 20 35 years and obviously the pandemic has been biting us in the ass for almost two years now. Yeah, some of what I have seen regarding like some solution conversation has just been like revolving around, I mean, massive, massive reform to like reuse a lot more everything because I think like waste, waste disposal, and even like reproduction when maybe like you don't need to reproduce this whole thing you instead could reproduce this part that often breaks mm. could be part of the solution and yeah what you had said just kind of reminded me of that theme more generally about like waste from one person's plant becoming another person's I don't know input but just like really looking at the systems in place within a city or within a setting or within a nation or a state, wherever it is to say like, where is there misuse of resources? Um, and then how can we redirect those resources to be like a positive input for somewhere else? And you're right, like it's not the most cost efficient way to run a business. It might add like you, it, there's probably several years of time it might take to transition but like if we could transition aggressively then maybe we could start curbing some of the like more long-term effects i think of like climate change well i think most of the most of the areas outside the donut are all regarding climate so mm -hmm. yeah yeah totally uh so yeah, Amsterdam was was a COVID thing, so they launched it. I think so early twenty twenty one, um, or yeah, early mm -hmm. twenty. It was during twenty twenty early. 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, 2021, yeah. Awesome. Um, cool. They formally implemented it. But yeah, so I think it's uh, definitely at least an idea that that can take us away somewhat from, yeah, I mean, like you guys said, the, the one use yeah, more wasteful uh, processes and yeah i mean just to to think about like the the bottom line and to bring up a term from classical economics that never really vibed with me is the concept of an externality and an externality is uh something that is external to the it's a cost but it's something that is external to the cost that somebody might pay to make something Um, so like if I'm paying to make these shoes, I'm not like actively putting dollars towards the cost of the CO2 I'm producing. So, oh, CO2 is just an externality Mm. or like if I'm polluting the water, that's like a cost, right? But it's external to what I'm paying. So it's an externality. And that's just one term that, uh, also never, jive with me but i i wanted to bring up too that and that was uh part of the motivating factor behind her uh coming up with the donut theory was this concept of it being external it's like nope it's here and it's around us if there was one thing like i'm just curious off the top of your guys's heads if you guys have thought of anything that you might reduce reuse recycle if you were to come up with a recycling business that used one man's trash and made it your treasure first and foremost i think there should be an externality tax Mm. i've never heard that term before maybe i have but it like hasn't stuck out to me and i'm like yeah that is a cost why like why don't we pay for that and like why don't the people who are purchasing things that are more reusable like then they could be saving money in comparison to people who are like purchasing styrofoam and I mean other things that are just known to not be good for the environment or like don't cringe at this all right but there are cities where straws are outlawed like we know that they're bad for the environment we know that they like cause problems for turtles and I mean yeah you could just pay 25 cents if you need a straw I don't know. Those are those are some of the thoughts that like went through my mind rather than what I could find in people's trash. Mm. Yeah, there is a a carbon tax that like has been proposed at, at different levels uh and yeah, I mean that's the idea is to make people pay, but it's really difficult cuz it's like kind of the, it would require lots of monitoring and all these things. Um and also people don't want to pay it like or companies in particular don't want to pay it so that's the other challenge with it uh but is there is there anything that you guys have noticed in your own lives notice that we should reuse we should reuse or reduce or something yeah i think I mean, yeah, I'm sure plenty of things, obviously, <laughs> but I, I would have to say, like, obviously, like things, like simple things, like carpooling are a thing. We don't mm. need two cars, just and like obviously, you can always justify it specifically living in a big city. Yeah, you can just be like, or like if you live on a little bit elsewhere, a little bit far from work, you can always be, like, oh, like I need a car to do this and do that, and time and traffic and blah 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 blah. you can always do that as opposed to oh we have to wake up or leave 30 minutes earlier so that my wife and i can just take one vehicle i think that's one of the things that weighs the i just feel so out. cool now because Aiden and i share a car and yeah i'm saving the environment one carpool at a time that is cool i can't <laughs> lie i just saw somebody else that they posted one of my friends posted oh we're a two-car family for the first time in three and a half years i was like and they're you know like my age i was like whoa well you like you guys have only been using one car for three and a half years that's so awesome and i don't know exactly why that was but i just thought that was super cool 
But that's one of the first things that pops up to me. Of course, going back to our shoe podcast, it's just, do we need to be as consumerist, as trendy, um, as wasteful with, our, you know, we get, I don't know, you get like a tiny rip or something like you can sew it up as opposed to throwing mm-hmm. it away or getting rid of it. Yeah. Simple things like that for sure. And to your point about externalities, I, isn't like they have taxes on vehicles, right? It's more prominent in California because of the pollution, but those are externality taxes, aren't they? And that's why if you drive a Tesla and an all electric car, you get tax breaks. In California, but I think California is the only state in the US, isn't it? So I cannot speak for sure because I think that there's like different, like there might that be different be things totally that say, but there I, might be different things that like we're talking about because there might be like there's the manufacturer and then there's the consumer like who is who might be paying the tax. I do think oh, that paying it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, I I mean. Yeah, definitely California, I know, has more strict air pollution laws So they're, and air standard laws. So vehicles that are sold there at the very least need to be like up to a certain fuel efficiency, but that's a little bit outside of the like tax realm. Um, so uh, more of the story, I'm not 100% though, in sure. Like, like in Norway, right? And in mm-hmm. other places too, for sure, yeah, where well. you can get breaks for like driving a more uh, energy efficient vehicle that's better for the environment. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of things I think that you can do on an individual level that like might apply some to donut economics. And I think just being aware that it's a balance um, and being more aware of the model can could probably help a lot of people live more sustainable lives. And outside of the fact that it's sustainable and saving the planet and blah, 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 sustainability can save money, right? Like for you personally as a consumer. So one thing that I have done and I hope that I don't like lose hold of as I continue to get into my professional career, but has been like purchasing most of my clothes from used, like from used places or like thrift shops. And I think that that like, it makes me feel good because I know that it should be like lessening it should be lessening some material impacts and hopefully also some supply chain impacts depending on where you're getting it from. But yeah, there's a whole, there's, I mean, there's a whole host, I think of areas you can think about that balance applied to donut economics and then kind of taking it back to your life of like, okay, how am I living outside the means of like the planet, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, or, or maybe you flip the question, how could I better live inside the means of, of the planet? And like, yeah, I'd never thought about the car thing, but we share a car and it's not always easy, but it's where it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been biking to, to work, which has been new and it's been good. Yeah. It's been good for my health. We'll see how biking in the winter goes. But yeah. Are you going to get one of those fat tires? Uh, at the very least, some studded tires. Okay. Uh, that's what... I've got a friend who does it a bike in the winter and he uses just some studded tires and um yeah so i'll try i'll give it a try and and we'll see cool yeah that's great i hope you do i know lauren hopes you do too because working on those glutes right <laughs> my, one of my friends has been on me about that too he sent me a picture of a biker he was in chicago and there was a biker on the side of the road and he sent me a picture of him and this dude was just yo like legs just <laughs> rippling but just immaculate and i was just like man i need to start biking for sure i'm notorious for having no butt and it, it saddens me and it it's not fun one of my issues with the question posed is that whenever you look at statistics on waste effects on climate change pollution etc you're going to see numbers like 70 89 90 percent of that is going to be from corporations so that's where it is like obviously don't know economics the philosophy, I like the philosophical and moral consistency of doing it as an individual. Like I recycle, but in the day, whether I recycle or not really doesn't matter that much to the planet. It matters to us as a society. It probably matters. It matters to me as a person, like how I view myself. But at the end of the day, if we don't impl- apply 
a framework like Don't Economics, it's not. It's going to be all for not if the corporations aren't held responsible. And like you said, they're not. They're held for the externalities because it's just like for me. It's why I have a problem with tipping because I'm like this company is not paying their people their wages. They're making me supplement their wages. Same thing. The government is not holding corporations accountable. So now I'm paying the gov- the these companies costs. I'm paying externalities. I'm paying for all these taxes and fees and this and that. And it's like. What's going on with these companies? And obviously, they are, there's a ton that goes into running a business. There's a ton of taxes, all that stuff, and there's loopholes, whatever. But at the end of the day, we are not protecting the planet, obviously. Our governments are, I don't know if they're pushing off for another generation. I don't know what's going on. But it's not helping. And obviously, we as people, we are voters. Maybe we need to hit these streets. I don't know. I'm not saying I have. I haven't. I'm not, I'm not an activist like that. But maybe I need to do. Maybe that's something I need to do as opposed to feeling good about driving a Prius. I need to be writing letters to these politicians and trying to get the word out like, hey guys, friends, peers, young people, this is what's happening. Let's go change it. Yeah, uh, I think that's super valid. I do know, so one measure that some cities have enacted is so the city of of Minneapolis, uh, plastic bags at Mm. checkout cost five cents a pop (laughs) and (laughs) It, it encourages people to bring their own bags, uh, for sure. I mean, it it definitely, it doesn't eliminate the ba- plastic bag use, which, I mean, may or may not. Uh, but, it, I mean, I, I would think it, it takes a, a big step um, in that direction, or at least somewhat of a step in that direction. But, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that the policy level is where a lot of the stuff will need to get done. And so whether it's through advocacy or if you're a common scientist excited about politics or, or whatever else, uh, I think that that's super valuable and, and a place to invest time. What I have, a, I have a question. And if you guys don't have an answer, I'll say one or two of mine first. But what is one of the, speaking of economics, what is one of the most extreme economic policies or concept you guys have ever heard most extreme i'll go first if you guys i'm thinking maybe give maybe i didn't word it correctly so one of the most extreme ones i've heard is that and it was posited to me from my friend kareem abunaga who's an amazing guy out in new york doing some amazing work in education he was a he i don't he didn't create it but he was the first person to say this to me like eight years ago he was just like, I think that one of the most important things to help with the economy and help more specifically with wealth distribution is a global ban on inheritance. Mm. So you cannot hand down your wealth, so your, you know, your descendants, your progeny. And I was like, whoa, okay, hold on. And then you went through it all, right? All the economic stuff that would happen that would happen all the the cold would trickle down all that type of stuff and i was like huh i guess so and how that would encourage them not to encourage the wealthy or whoever not to just hoard and hand down and this and that but to actually pump it back into the economy whether it be by will or i guess by policy force thoughts on that or your own extremes so yeah. i've heard of it and i think I think it makes a lot of sense. I think you should absolutely be able to help your your kids out while you're still living. And so however you could invest in their success, and I'm obviously, I mean, just like, yeah, spend in, in their success or maybe literally invest. But I think that that probably should be allowed, right? <laughs> At least until they're 18. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Um, But I think that there's a lot to be said about the massive amount of wealth that is just sitting around and, like, is not doing anything for anyone other than to see, like, zeros or arbitrary numbers grow in some account. Uh, And I think it probably would do a lot of good for the world if that could be unlocked for use. I also recently had a conversation with someone who was talking about specifically the problems, more systemic problems in America, and how how unique the founding of America was in that 
um, a large proportion or a large portion of people were sent here and it was like more people than were sent to any other founding colony. And it was underfunded in comparison to many other places. And so like when you're th thinking of systemic issues in America, this is what this person was saying. When you're thinking about systemic issues in America, we have been even before slavery, like underfunded by millions of dollars, which if, if you adjust for inflation today is probably trillions of dollars. And so without unlocking a resource like trillions of dollars sitting, which we know in the U.S. especially, there are trillions of dollars sitting that are owned by people in the U.S. I'm guessing they're in offshore or whatever accounts. But like, I think unlocking that could be super helpful. And I've always had, like maybe there would be some money handed down from my parents to me, but I've always had that idea that like, I'm not entitled to that money. Like that money, I did not do anything to deserve that money. And so like that money, if it came to me, fine. But also like that money doesn't exist to me right now. So if it came to me, I too, as the progeny could decide like this money was never mine. I'm going to give it away or I'm going to do whatever with it. So I think that's fascinating. The thing that came to my mind when you asked the question originally, though, was the pushback um, when I've heard fat tax in conversation. Uh, right. And I don't know, I mean, it's, I don't know that it's so economically related, but it just was like when I was thinking of policy and effects on money and effects on human health, which is kind of tied to donut economics. <laughs> what? Because it's a donut or because it actually like talks about health? Why are you laughing? I was just, I was just laughing about fat tax and donut economics. <laughs> that was just funny. Okay. But needless <laughs> to say, like, it's gotten so much pushback when it has come up, uh, like, historically. Mm -hmm. And it just seems so intuitive that, like, like, it could help promote healthy living. Yeah. Explain uh, what the fat tax is. Oh, yeah. So the idea of a fat tax is that uh, basically there would be an additional taxes tabbed on or added on to unhealthy foods, essentially. I think the hardest thing about it is like deciding what actually is an unhealthy food. And like, because caloric need varies so much for different people, it's just a challenging policy mm -hmm. to implement in general. Probably it'd be better to have a sugar tax than a fat tax, but those ideas people get nervous about because it's like about their food. Yeah. And I think people mm -hmm. feel like it infringes on freedom. Yeah, they had a sugar tax start the Revolutionary War. So Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. <funny. laughs> yeah, I'm down for the sugar tax. <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. Oh, there'd be fires in the street. <laughs> Not as bad as if there was a coffee tax. Oh, man. Oh. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's mighty true. Okay. Um, man. Uh, yeah, both of those ideas are pretty wild. Um, one idea that's a little bit of a kind of complementary to the idea that you posited, Dre, is... Uh, it is this idea of like setting up a mini trust fund for every kid when they're born in in the country and i think it was like six thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars invested at birth would be enough for somebody like invested in just a stock market index fund, which is just like a simple, uh, I mean, it sounds complicated, but it's a relatively simple investment strategy could produce a million dollars by somebody's retirement. And like that, the simplicity of something like that versus some of the other like uh, social security funds and all of the complicated management of that mm -hmm. uh i think i mean i just i do appreciate that where it's like oh here's a lump sum at birth and that's paid by our th taxes that would be paid by our taxes um, well so i think he was just suggesting it in general um it was this 
he was just bringing it up as an idea and he did, I don't think he suggested it like in from a policy standpoint he was just like oh like here's a fun fact about investing if you put in this much at birth um I'm sure it's I think it I think Corey Brooks ran for president he was proposing something of that variety but I mean the idea of just investing a lump sum at somebody's birth and then have that be their retirement fund at 65. Uh, obviously, they could put more money into it or, uh, as they go on. But I think that that's something that's seriously overlooked in the U.S. is is helping people figure out their retirement fund because it's all opt-in and mm-hmm. all these, I mean, there's all these barriers for people to like save uh, adequately for retirement. Yeah, I agree. That that's the thing with I believe the politician is Cory Booker. Cory Booker, yeah, you're right. You're I didn't right. know that that was a part of his policy or ideology. I th- I think it was I don't it wasn't the 6700 but I think it was he had some trust fund idea. Okay. That sounds cool. I I would definitely before that. Obviously, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but we're, we're able to make so many things work in America as human beings so i think all of us being taxed whatever amount so that each kid is trusted with 750 dollars at birth that's completely within our means if you think that's a radical idea it's just because the overton window has been so shifted to, towards self-interest that it's hard for us to even fathom something that is really quite simple honestly i think that's a great idea i've never i don't think i've ever heard it, it sounds awesome um, I, I would honestly be in favor of something like that and a, a freedom dividend as our guy Andrew Yang would call <laughs> yeah. it. Whereas, and I think I would even, so some people are really troubled by the freedom dividend, which is a universal basic income, a thousand dollars a month, 12 grand a year. Obviously we have this weird individualistic complex in America where it's like, you're not owed anything in the world and you can't have a thousand dollars per month because then you're going to get lazy and never do anything with your life and blah, blah. And it's like $12,000 a month is poverty. It's like no one, almost nobody in America is going to be satisfied with making $12,000 a year. year, Sorry. thousand, twelve thousand a year. Sorry. 12,000 a month is ball. (laughs) Like (laughs) 12,000 a month. We we would be Gucci. A thousand a month, 12,000 a year. So I, I would be for something with that, even if we like kind of scaffold or a stagger where it's like when you're young, you get like thousand dollars a month. And then as you maybe 25, it goes down to 500 a month, 35, it's gone, something like yeah. that. I would like for you just to be, you're an American. We live in the richest na- nation that ever exists. You get a universal breast again. Yeah, that's fine. But if people are really that worried about it, I'll, be, I'll even be open to the trust fund and adding something like that, where it just slowly and then 35, hopefully you can stand on your own two feet. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, I I'm also in the in that uh, of that mindset. Um, so Cory Booker, his was not the idea where you just invest the sixty seven hundred dollars and let it be. Uh, so his idea is similar. He calls it baby bonds, where uh, every every child born in the U.S. would uh, they would create a trust fund of at least a thousand dollars in it. And depending on the wealth of your family, every child would get a deposit up annually up to the age of 18 into that account, upwards of $2,000 for the lowest income children. Mm. And so depending on the family's income, they could have nearly 50 grand at 18. Wow. Which 50 grand at 18 could do wonders for some people. But yeah, so that's that was the idea that he had proposed in his run for president cool i've never been a big fan of him um based on everything else i've heard but that sounds awesome (laughs) you've been quiet for a little while yeah there were a couple of thoughts i just think like maybe it's because i'm a female Mm -hmm. and maybe it's because of my like background growing up in rural america Mm -hmm. but in conversations about economics or dollars or like, I sometimes feel like I don't have permission to talk. Like I have this 
like this implicit, maybe explicit, because now I'm thinking about it, about it, bias that like what I have to say couldn't possibly like add to the conversation. So yeah, I have been quiet. There have been a few thoughts, but I, like I couldn't even tell you really what or where I'll try to do to better if I think of something. But yeah, I think because the field has been so dominated by men, also growing up in my household at home, my mom didn't have much say in the finances and my parents didn't talk about it. My dad just did what was the manly, whatever, like thing to do with finances. And I'm just becoming more like responsible for my own finance now. And a lot of the conversation honestly just makes me angry because it seems like so fixable like, there are so many potential solutions. People just need to get their head out of their butts and, like, choose one and, like, try it and see if it works. And it seems like there's so much accessible funds out there that are just, yeah, mm -hmm. sitting in accounts and tied up in this or that. Like, it seems just so asinine that we, like, live in the type of society that we do with as much, like, inequality and, and equity as there is. I'm 100% yeah. with you. I think, again, I think mo most of the conversation and what is seen as radical, it's just because of the Overton window. It's just there's a small group of people who are controlling the narrative, and some of them are stuck in traditions like Keynesian economics, where you can't even talk about something like a UBI. You can't even talk about, like, because it's always, where are we going to get the money for this deforestation relief or this? starving children thing or that, or that and it's just like where do we get the money for anything where do we get the money for any of the stuff that we're just the government is dumping the money into dumping our you know gdp or whatever it is deficit spending all that stuff into it and i just think really going to economics right just this general philosophy change and it obviously i think it does it has to start with the people it has to start with us realizing that we do have power to vote and to make phone calls and emails. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that I do these things. I should, but we do have the power to educate ourselves that, hey, these things are possible, right? UBI is possible. This trust fund thing is possible. Saving the planet is possible. We're just not, the powers that be are not incentivized to do it. They need pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm 100% with you. I think it's, it's heartbreaking. And I'm not even, I'm not angry at the 1% or whoever who's up there because they're human beings. If I was a billionaire, if I were a billionaire, would I be dumping all my money into some philanthropist thing without any kickback? Probably not. Like, I would be a billionaire, right? I'd be focused on growth and, you know, self-actualization and all that stuff. I'm not saying that they're evil people or anything like that. But at the end of the day, our, we have planetary boundaries and we're reaching them quickly. There's always been a deficit in the social needs of humans across the board. And we all are familiar with some of these just absurd statistics about how many starving children there are, how many people who die from malaria, how many people are victims of mutilation, all these genocide, all these things that if we focus on them, if we dumped our money into those instead of constant growth, we could help solve some of these issues or at least get to a much better place. On that note, Common Scientists, thanks so much for tuning in this week on our donut economics topic. I hope this challenges you to think a little bit more about your own life, about economics as a whole and how crazy big it is, but also about advocating for yourself. You're a Common Scientist. That means you can do some research yourself, find out what you're most excited about that maybe fits in with the realm of donut economics, and you can advocate and Together, maybe we will be able to live better inside the means of our planet. Hey, Common Scientists. Hope you enjoyed the cast. Thanks for investing in Common Science. We hope it brought as much value to you as it did to us. To learn more, smash the subscribe button and visit our website, commonscientists.com, where you can read our blog, join our email newsletter, and follow us on social media. Finally, if you like what we have to say, you can absolutely support us on Patreon. We can always use more support. You can navigate there also from our website, commonscientists.com, common scientists with an S, so that we can continue cultivating a community of common scientists.